Okay, good evening. I am Lauren Gates, your host, and welcome to tonight's Airway Health Solutions Conversation featuring Dr. Gerald Simmons. Welcome, Dr. Simmons. It's always great to have you back. I well, think thanks, this is your, your third time with us. So, three, so times, it's a charm. <laughs> three times is a charm. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, tonight I'm really excited just because we're going to have a more uh, casual format, more like a town hall meeting. So um, everyone out there, welcome, and please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A session um, section on the Zoom bar. I have all of your questions that you had entered in your registration, but let's, let's get rolling because we have a lot of questions. But before I do, just wanted to give some background information for those who don't know Dr. Simmons, which I can't imagine are many at this point in the airway industry, but uh, Dr. Gerald Simmons is a triple board certified in neurology, epilepsy, and sleep medicine. He's a graduate of uh, Ohio State University, and he did his neurology residency at Washington University, his sleep medicine fellowship at Stanford University, and epilepsy fellowship at the University of California. He began his career as assistant professor of neurology at UCLA while co-directing the UCLA Sleep Disordered Center and directing the clinical neurophysiology uh, lab at all of you UCLA Medical Center, where there he trained fellows, taught residents, and medical students. What I really would like to talk about, Dr. Simmons, is your transition to form. Um, in 2004, you established the Sleep Education Consortium. You want to tell us a little bit about that? It's a not a nonprofit organization? Well, yeah. So, you know, I was, um, you know, in academics at UCLA, and then I uh, was recruited to come out to Houston uh, to join a um, private practice, a, a multi specialty clinic. And uh, the concept of academic medicine um, uh, was uh, still well in entrenched within my uh, my daily uh, um, perspective of, of my medical career. And I enjoyed education and educating other healthcare professionals. And it's became, it became really clear uh, throughout the 90s that uh, there was a major deficit in health education with regards to sleep. And so I decided that since I was no longer in an academic environment, I was going to start an educational organization that would help raise the level of awareness of sleep disorders in the community. And that's what the Sleep Education Consortium uh, uh, was, that's its main mission. And uh, so it is a nonprofit organization, a 501c3, and we've been having um, annual conferences um, on sleep disorders, but um, it was important right from the beginning to not have this directed just at physicians, because I realized early on in my career that uh, sleep involves so many different aspects, and I recognize the role that dentists can have in the field of sleep medicine, because they're looking in the mouths of every, every one of their patients. And if the dentist just knew some key facts, they can start screening patients for sleep apnea and uh, they can identify so many patients that are getting missed by physicians. And not only could they screen, but they also had something to offer from a treatment standpoint. So I included dentists as part of my target audience uh, for the Sleep Education Consortium right from the get-go. And uh, this has evolved. Our first conference was in 2004. And we've been at this pretty much every year. We missed last year because of the pan pandemic. Um, so this is our 16th uh, actual um, time having our conference. It's coming up actually in a few weeks. It's coming up at the end of April. Exciting. Yeah. It's amazing that you've been doing this for, for so long and so many people are just still hearing about it now in the year, you know, 2022. What are your feelings about how it's evolved? And do you see um, a huge breakthrough since you started? Or do you feel like we still have mountains to go to kind of connect that, that bridge? Well, we still have mountains to go. <laughs> now, with regards to this, the Sleep Education Consortium, I feel that it's very um, under, um, 
utilized. I, how to say it? I mean, you know, this is not a full time job. I mean, there are organizations out there that that's all they do is they're out there educating and promoting, and they have multiple conferences on a regular basis. And you know, it's become uh, you know they might have full full time staff dedicated. This is a sort of a, a side kick, if you will, um, something that you know, it's not the main part of my practice. It's something on the, that we do once a year and I'm leveraging off of my staff to help pull this off. And we get a lot of support from Space Maintainers Laboratory, um, mm -hmm. helping to reach out to the dental community and um, and just other organizations that have, have helped. The AAPMD has been a big um, uh, help in getting the words out. And we're actually evolved to be part of the AAPMD from an educational standpoint. Um, but so this has evolved tremendously since I started. When I first uh, um, was taking on this approach to educate dentists, uh, a lot of dentists were very naive and they would say, sleep, why? They didn't understand. And now it's like in vogue. It's like dentists, it's the thing to do to become an airway dentist. And there, uh, there's so many different conferences out there now. And there are very few that are like ours. And ours was the first that actually had dentists and physicians sitting together in the same lecture hall, uh, hearing the same material. And it was funny because at the beginning of the conference, the physicians would wonder like, why is there a dentist there? Or they would go through like the, the vendor area and there would be all these like dental appliances and the physicians would start like puzzled. Like, what is this? What does this have anything to do with anything? And then by the end of the conference, the physicians recognized the, the, the significance that the dentist had. And the dentist appreciated more of all the different aspects of sleep medicine and realized that you know they can't be in a silo just working on their own because what they're dealing with affects so many other aspects of, of medicine. So things have evolved a lot, but I, I think that um, if I were to do this as a full-time endeavor, there would be a, a much further outreach, if you will, but I'm leveraging off others and I appreciate the opportunity tonight, for example, Lauren. To, oh, you know, we, talk about anytime. <laughs> we love your knowledge and we, we really appreciate your pioneer spirit because in a sense, we're all pioneers here, but you've just been doing this for, for a long time. You really laid down the groundwork. So thank you um, for, for doing that. And can you give us an update on the Children's Airway Screener Task Force? Well, um, you know, we're tracking along. We're, I mean, we're right now looking, uh, we, we need to get funding is really where we're at. And um, again, this is something where, you know, it's volunteer time. Everyone that's involved is, uh, is volunteered. And we're looking at various avenues for funding. So what we have is uh, some, we have the, the screener device that we, that can, uh, the idea is to utilize this on an extremely large scale and there are a lot of screening tools out there, but most screening tools uh, take, they're very, um, they, they either have part of the exam involved with them. And so it takes a, um, a skilled professional that knows how to implement it, or they're very long and there's multiple questions mm -hmm. in it. Um, and we, it can be done. So if someone comes into an office with a, with a presentation of a problem, you can, there's a motivation by the patient or the parent of the patient to take more time to fill this out. But when you're trying to screen on a large scale, meaning you want to screen everybody, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to be quick and simple. So our screening um, tool is something that can actually be administered in the schools and, you know, uh, I mean, it doesn't require a dentist or a, a healthcare professional to administer this. But the, the, the thing that we are looking to do is to validate this in terms of, because it's just the front line. It's not all about just the screener. It's what is the protocol that follows a positive result of the screener. And then there are secondary evaluations that lead ultimately to where the child may actually get a sleep study done. And then an intervention is done. So when you have a screener, you don't want it to um, uh, be, um, uh, uh, you don't want to miss anyone. So it's got to be very sense, it's got to be very sensitive, but it may not be specific. Right. So it's going to pick up false positives. So then you want the secondary 
uh, assessments to start to differentiate which one, which of these patients or individuals really need to get further assessment. So we um, have a big vision and it takes time to get things implemented, uh, but and we're not there yet. Right. Well, it's going to raise awareness, that's for sure, even just with the with patients, just to be talking about it is going to raise the awareness, which many times that's how things get done, you know, from the patient or the consumer side, if you would. I'm just going to give a quick medical disclaimer here, because uh, sometimes we do have patients listening as well. So the content presented tonight is not intended to be a substitute for professional dental or medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, dentist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Okay, so um, our first question actually from Dr. Zombeck, He's, uh, she says, good evening, Dr. Simon. How do we have our patients get in touch with you for sleep tests and what do you need prior? Okay, great question. Well, yeah, I'm always, right off the I'm, always, <laughs> I'm very happy to always um, do that. Well, the simplest thing is to go to our webpage and that's uh, www.csma.clinic. Real simple. And from the web page, they can fill out a questionnaire. And that questionnaire gives us basic information and then and with contact information, then we then can reach out to the patient. Um, or if you contact us, uh, contact me, I'd be happy to give you referral forms. And that way it's always better because the patient may be very motivated when they walk out of your office but then the stressors of daily living will pull them in multiple directions and one week goes by and then two weeks go by and they never really follow through on your recommendation. But if you initiate the process by reaching out to our office, by emailing us uh, one of the requisitions or faxing it to us, then we'll take it from there and we'll keep you informed as we go through the process um, to uh, communicate you know, with the patient. Wonderful. And can you tell us a little bit about that workflow? Like, let's say, I know we have a lot of dentists who um, would love to utilize your services. Can you just kind of walk us through the flow? Like once, how does that work? The process? Okay. So there's, um, you know, the uh, first part is, you know, knowing that the patient needs to be assessed. Now, if you could send over any medical records, that would be great. Our one page uh, requisition form has a, a place where you basically you could well you could check off what it is you want so if you want a, you know a, um, an evaluation with follow-up which is really what we would prefer you just check off the box but then there's other questions like do you think this is a patient that's um, a good candidate for oral appliance therapy for sleep apnea you would check that off um, you know uh, and other there's other little parts on this form that you could check off but then, on the bottom, there's a little space where you could just write a one-liner, like what's your main objective? Why are you sending this patient? You just put something simple. That way we know what it is you're looking at. You may say this patient has sleep apnea, not a good candidate uh, for appliance therapy and needs uh, medical management. And then, okay. So I already know that you've told the patient that you need more than an oral appliance. But if you've had a discussion of using oral appliances, I'm going to call it the way I see it, but I am very supportive of using oral appliance therapy, knowing that it's not any, it's not a single mode of therapy that's going to treat all patients, um, but there's some patients that will do really well, but we have to understand what the compli the potential complications may be. Um, but if the patient comes back to having severe apnea, I'm going to reach out to you and say, I know that you wanted this patient to get an appliance, but the, this patient has cardiac uh, has a cardiac history and has severe sleep apnea. And I think as a first line therapy, we may want to consider CPAP, for example. And actually, at, right after I'm done with this talk, I'm actually doing another talk for the AAPMD. And in that uh, another webinar, and that webinar is uh, about how there's no panacea for treating the airway. There, okay. there, and I'm going to cover um, many different types of treatments for um, treating sleep apnea. So, well, we have a double header this evening because we just yeah, put the uh, registration link in the chat. So don't miss that because you'll have a full presentation on, on this topic, which you can really never get enough information. There's so much to learn. So thank you. Um, Dr. Province would like to know, first he says hello, and do you feel a home sleep test is helpful? Helpful? Yeah, but that's a pretty uh, open-ended question. Is it helpful? Yes. 
I think what I'm wondering if what you may be asking, do I think it's reliable in ruling out sleep apnea? No. All right. So now, what do I mean? You can use a home sleep test to rule in the diagnosis of sleep apnea, um, assuming that the person you think is getting tested is the person utilizing the device, um, you know, because what's the chain of command? How do you know that the patient that you give it to is actually the one going to use it? But assuming that it is the right patient, um, or, you know, because there could be secondary gain for someone to be uh, um, coming up with a diagnosis of sleep apnea who may not have sleep apnea, but let's assume you get it on the person that you administer it to. Um, you know, uh, if it comes back positive, then you could feel, uh, now when I say positive, I'm talking about the apnea hypopnea index and not some derived uh, other parameter. Um, the home studies in terms of the RDI, respiratory disturbance index, I'm not as comfortable with those uh, because you really need, you know, the more subtle the condition, the more elaborate the testing needs to be. So having said that, if a home study comes back negative, it doesn't mean the patient doesn't have sleep apnea. And I've done multiple lectures. If you've heard any of my lectures, I've given multiple examples uh, of, of that. And sometimes the patients, well, the next step would be to bring the patient into a sleep lab, but, in, but not all in-lab studies are done the same. I mean, there's a lot to this to this uh, topic. With some patients, we actually have to put a nasoesophageal pressure catheter to measure the pressures inside their airway to uh, identify these effort-related arousals that are disturbing the sleep continuity. So a, a home study is not going to pick up uh, um, upper airway resistance syndrome, which is really a form of obstructive sleep apnea. It's not going to really pick that up reliably in, in many patients. Now, there'll be people that will challenge me and say, oh yes, I can identify it, but the patient may have periodic leg movements of sleep and it's gonna give similar kinds of abnormalities in terms of repetitive arousals. So if you're gonna use heart rate fluctuation, heart rate variability as a way of identifying arousal, you don't necessarily know what the cause of that arousal was. And oxygen does not need to drop in a patient with obstructive breathing. And if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, um, and this is sort of surprising to you that I'm telling you it's not all about oxygen. Um, you really need to come to our conference. Um, and um, if you want to hear more about the con or you want to find out more about the conference, just to tell you the, the web page for this conference, which is at the end of the month, it's dentalsleepconference.com. It's a three-day course, and you're going to learn a lot. And by the time you walk out of there, it, it will transform your thinking about airway and airway management, and um, you'll be empowered with a lot of information. Wonderful. For pediatric patients, if we are treating without a sleep test, um, what major issues may we be missing? Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, you know, treating. Treating what? I mean, so, when treat, so I'm assuming you're talking about treating airway. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're treating the airway, it should be because you do have a test that has shown an abnormality. If you're, if, but if you're treating because of, let's say, um, uh, there are feeding issues and, um, or there's uh, speech issues. There's, it was the underdeveloped arches, basically. Okay, so, arches. so the issue of the underdeveloped arches is going, you know, does it contribute to nasal congestion? Are there other symptoms going on with the individual? Uh, I would encourage you to try to get a study done to know what you're dealing with. And that also gives you an idea of how aggressive you may need to be. You know, are you good? Not, not everyone that, has uh, an airway that looks compromised is going to necessarily be um, hindered in the same way because we're dealing with a neuromuscular condition, not just a structural one. Okay, the, so the muscles of your airway and the soft tissue of your airway contribute to airway function, not just skeletal structure. So um, it's all involved. So it's really good, you know, if you have a child that is not sleeping well, they have ADHD symptoms. Um, uh, they're uh, snoring. Obviously, you've got a problem. Now, someone will say, well, why don't I just treat the uh, underdeveloped arches 
and not worry about getting the study. Well, I think it's worthwhile to, to have a starting point um, that you can use for comparison as you're going forward with therapy. Um, and so, uh, you know, now it may be where your hands are tied and you can't get the assessment done. Does that mean you shouldn't intervene uh, with something that you obviously see as being a deficiency in someone's anatomy? No, I think you could probably go forward, but I think you want the support. I mean, what if, some, what if something goes wrong? If something goes wrong, then people are going to challenge you. Like, what, why, why did you do this? And if you have a, a study that supports the reasoning, because you have a diagnosis, that can help in case things don't go as planned. And how early can you start a home sleep study on a child? Well, that's um, a good question. We really don't know. <laughs> I mean, the, the recommendations are, are all over the place. Um, and, you know, I would say that uh, as a, you know, there are people that are doing home studies on, on two-year-olds, three-year-olds, you know, but is there good data to support that? No, but if it's abnormal, can we use that as a basis of treatment? Yes. An abnormal home study is, uh, so it, it's specific. It's not, it may not be a sensitive, but it's specific. So if you get a home study and it clearly is abnormal, not mildly, not borderline. And when I say abnormal, I'm talking about, let's say the desaturation index. So that you're looking at the oxygen level and you're seeing repetitive uh, drop in the oxygen by let's say 3% or 4% repetitively through the night and with a certain pattern. That's a really good indication that the person probably has obstructed sleep apnea. You couple that with the clinical presentation and that's, that's good. But let's say you have a clinical suspicion and you do the home study and it's not giving you the answers you need. You really want to go forward and do an in-lab study. And not everything is breathing related. Home studies are really only going to help you with breathing. Sleep problems are not all related to breathing. Periodic leg movements of sleep, for example, or nocturnal seizures you know, are common uh, occurrences. Even poor sleep hygiene. You know, there could be, be a poor, the dynamic in the home environment may be very destructive to proper sleep. Which home sleep monitors do you prefer if you use them? <laughs> Let's not go down that pathway. Um, that sounds good. Uh, because I'm not going to sit there and endorse any one company and... Um, Maybe just more the... What's that? I said maybe just more like a, a general well, <laughs> overview. You know, it, it depends. I mean... Look, I'm doing monitoring on some patients with just, uh, you know, just wearing, you know, an oximeter ring. That's not the basis of my diagnosis. That's not the level of care that I provide. I bring people into the lab and we'll do full polysomnography on some of them and we'll put full electrodes to measure for seizures and we'll put nasoesophageal pressure, on, you know, catheter down their nose on some patients. So each case should be tailored based on what's going on, all right? Um, so you, if you're going to do home testing, let's back up. If you're a dentist, I don't think you should be doing home testing. It's outside the scope of your specialty. I am extremely supportive of dentists working in the field of sleep medicine. But I don't sit there and make appliances. I don't pull, t I don't, I don't, uh, Put braces on people. I don't, um, you know, I don't assess the dentition. I, mean, I do in my physical exam, but I don't implement any kinds of treatments um, for dentistry. And I don't do, uh, I don't do cone beam CTs. You know, I don't. That's the next question, right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there people need to understand the 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 scope of what's appropriate within their practice. And um, I think a dentist needs to learn to collaborate with a physician, and it should be a, a dental-friendly physician. Um, but that isn't someone that's just going to give them uh, a green light to do whatever they want to do, but someone that's going to truly collaborate. And, uh, and then the dentist has to realize that not all patients are going to be properly treated with appliance therapy, you know? 
there are patients that need other types of treatments. So, um, you know, there's, so I, you know, so I would rather do it like this. The question should be, what am I looking for in the sleep specialist that I'm referring to to feel comfortable that they're doing good work? And what kind of testing device should I be looking for them to be utilizing? Well, I think what they need to have is more of a stratified level of care, meaning if all they are is a home sleep test, that's, that's not good. If they're going to use a home sleep test, that's fine. It could be a, a level you know, a three test that is going to have, let's say, oximetry, heart rate variability, you know, heart rate, uh, movement of the chest, airflow through the nose and mouth. You know, if some people will say, well, what about, you know, the, a test that has tonometry, okay, that doesn't measure flow, and it's going to have, you know, um, um, or cardiopulmonary coupling, you know, that's going to just be real simple wearing an oximeter. Those are tools are okay, but you have to realize the facility you're referring to needs to then have other capability beyond that. So when you don't get the information you're looking for with that home test, that facility needs to then state the patient needs to come in for a full in-lab study because the home study was negative. And you really want a facility that's going to have, get the history. It's not all about the test. It's about the test and the history behind the patient. So someone that has no symptoms whatsoever, no other medical conditions, um, and they get a home study and it comes back negative, fine. I don't know why the home study would have been done, but fine. If the patient has symptoms of daytime sleepiness, um, maybe they don't snore, you know, maybe they don't have any cardiovascular conditions, but they have sleepiness and fatigue. That home study means that it's not moderate to severe sleep apnea, but it could still be uh, sleep apnea. It could be more along the lines of upper airway resistance syndrome. And so now you can't just say, oh, the test is normal, goodbye. You now need to bring them to the next level of testing and then establish a diagnosis. And then you can go ahead and treat. And I have a lot of patients that are on dental appliances that had negative home studies. We brought them into the lab. We, we, we established the diagnosis of sleep apnea and now they're being treated. How often or at what point during the course of treatment should a sleep study be repeated? It depends on what's going on with the patient. So there's not a, it, it, to sit there and say, oh, you repeat the study every six months to a year. That's, that's ridiculous. So um, if you're, uh, I mean, let's address a specific clinical scenario. So let's say there's someone that's uh, diagnosed with sleep apnea. And then let's say I put them on CPAP. Okay, and let's say the insurance company says that I have to put them on auto titrating CPAP. So they're on an auto titration device. And let's say that initially they had sleep apnea that was of a, a you know, moderate to severe degree. And now they're on CPAP. And I've not done a study with them on CPAP because they're on an auto titrating machine. Um, I would want to do at least a home study to demonstrate that there's improvement. Uh, even though the machine is giving me information, the machine may be missing, uh, you know, the, the machines are limited in terms of their capability. So I think at least a home study um, would be worthwhile. Now, if a patient is, let's say, on CPAP and they're still sleepy during the day, so their symptoms have not been resolved, then the CPAP machine may be saying they're doing great on the, down, on the compliance downloads. I'll bring that patient into the lab and I'll do an in-lab titration but I'll want to probably follow it by a multiple sleep latency test to measure their sleepiness and to see if they have narcolepsy. So it's, you know, and then and patients with narcolepsy can also have sleep apnea. It's not like, you know, you either have one or the other. They're, you know, other, out of patients that have narcolepsy, I, at least 50% of them have some degree of sleep apnea. It's probably closer to 70% may have some degree of sleep apnea. Um, and the narcolepsy patients. So I have a lot of my narcolepsy patients that have come to me on referral from dentists. And the dentist has realized this person's very sleepy and I have them under an appliance, they're still sleepy. They're gonna send them to me and we'll figure it out. So, uh, my you, phone, oh, sorry, so again, there's no, so I guess the other scenario would be, what about if I get it, if you make a dental appliance? I think that might be more uh, appropriate for the, this group. 
So let's say they have a diagnosis of sleep apnea and then you put them on a dental appliance. I would say when you feel that you've optimally titrated them, you should repeat the, the study. And if their diagnosis was established by a home study, then you could use a home study um, to determine treatment efficacy. And if they're not having symptoms any longer and their home study comes back positive, then that's great. Um, if they're still sleepy, um, then you definitely, you want to do more than just do, doing a home study. I mean, you could start off with a home study and if it comes back negative, then they still need, then they probably need to come into the lab because maybe there's respiratory effort related arousals that are being missed on the home study, but the patient may have narcolepsy. So, you know, um, but one other scenario. So let's say I have a patient that's been tested and let's say they even came into the lab for a CPAP titration study. So they're on CPAP and they're doing well. And their study was 10 years ago and they're coming in for their annual follow-up and they're still doing well and all of their other health conditions are fine. I'm not going to restudy them. That same patient comes in and now they have new onset AFib. I'm going to study them, right? Or they come in and they've got a progressive hyper refractory hypertension. You know, even though they're using their CPAP, even though they're not sleepy, even though they're telling me they're doing things are fine, I'm going to restudy them. Now, what kind of study am I going to do? I'm going to do a study on their treatment because I want to see, I don't have to reestablish their diagnosis. That's a waste of time. I would do a study on CPAP to demonstrate that it's optimally set. And if not, we'll modify the pressure settings. So... Sharon Moore has a great question. What are your views on early interceptive growth guidance for children with OSA on CPAP? Okay, interceptive growth guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm assuming you mean certain kinds of... Uh, um, uh, like a myofunctional appliance or... I think it's great. I think it's important. I think that if, it's a little, if a child's on CPAP, it should be looked at as a transitional therapy just to temporarily treat their airway while other interventions are being administered. And if the intervention is gonna be uh, orthodontic uh, to try to open up their airway, which is a very appropriate way of treating a child, um, being on CPAP is a temporary measure. Getting the orthodontics um, implemented is the, the thing that should be done as soon as possible. And actually, early intervention at the ages of three and four years old is something that should be highly considered and actually come to the conference. Kevin Boyd is going to be talking about early intervention orthodontics to, um, to uh, you know, reduce the likelihood of developing sleep apnea later on. So, you know, that's really where we need to go. We need to start, we don't, it's not about the teeth, it's about the skeletal structures. So, you know, the concept of waiting till all the adult teeth are in before doing um, orthodontics is ridiculous. Uh, it, you could start doing these maneuvers at an earlier age if you have a patient that has a compromised airway. How do you approach specialists in, in this area you, with your statement that you just said? Do you, how, how do you go about that with your orthodontic specialists in your area that you work with? Well, I mean, I reach out to them and say, you know, here's a child um, that uh, we need to consider. I mean, there's not a lot of orthodontists that will do interventions at that age. And mm -hmm. I'm, not get, I'm not getting a lot of patients at that age because a lot of the pediatricians and a lot of the uh, pediatric dentists, this is new concepts for them. They mm -hmm. don't understand. So they, um, you know, the, uh, but there are some orthodontists um, in my area that do understand. And uh, so, I mean, I guess it's a question, how do I reach out to me? In other words, so obviously I'm going to send the patient to an orthodontist that, um, that does understand and has that concept. If not, I'm going to, I mean, if a couple of years ago, it, it was a different discussion. Um, and some of these concepts are relatively new also. So, you know, 10 years ago, I wasn't telling people to get orthodontics uh, in, at three or four years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were some people like Kevin that were already onto this, but um, I wasn't. But now that I understand, I, I don't want to miss that opportunity because it's a lot easier to um, modify the airway in a three or four year old than it is in a 12, you know, 14 year old. Amen, for sure. Um, uh, Dr. Stewart wants to know about central sleep apneas. Can you 
Can you discuss that? Uh, well, okay. So central sleep apnea, um, it is going to be when the brain is not giving the signals to the um, to the muscles to breathe. So it so it's apnea, but from a central nervous system standpoint, not from obstruction, right? So there is no role in uh, oral appliance therapy or um, anything that you're going to do from a dental standpoint for treating central sleep apnea. And CPAP does not treat central sleep apnea. We need to put those patients on a bi-level machine that has two different pressures with a timed backup mode, meaning it automatically fluctuates the pressures between the inspiratory and expiratory pressures um, automatically. Uh, that's for treating true central sleep apnea. Now, true central sleep apnea is not that common. What also is important to know is that a lot of times sleep studies are misread as being central sleep apnea. And uh, it, it's important to uh, understand, are there certain circumstances in where central apnea may occur and it may not be so, so abnormal, okay? And there are. So when you fall off to sleep, the, your respiratory drive is decreased. Your respiratory drive is based on carbon dioxide levels. And, and that set point in the brain fluctuates between whether you're awake or whether you're asleep. And so when you are um, asleep, your set point is higher. So your brain allows you to have more carbon dioxide. So when you just drift off to sleep, there's a decreased respiratory drive because your CO2 levels are not that high. So you'll have a central pause, you stop breathing, the CO2 level rises, and then you start to breathe again. That in and of itself is not that um, big of a deal. And it's called, and this thing called loop gain, all right? So if you have a high loop gain, you're very sensitive to the CO2 level, and you're more likely to have this central pause as you're transitioning to sleep. The problem is what happens once you start trying to breathe again? So once you start trying to breathe again, if you're breathing against obstruction of an airway, that obstruction is gonna lead to an arousal. And then when you have the arousal, your CO2 set point fluctuates again, and it's like having an awakening. But if, so then right after the arousal, you go right back to sleep, and that arousal may only have been three seconds long or so, you're going to have another central right as you go back to sleep. And then you're going to start trying to breathe again, and you're going to have obstruction leads to another arousal. So you're going to see these repetitive events but the awakenings are due to obstruction. The awakenings are not due to central. And once you treat the obstruction, you no longer get the awakenings and you no longer get this whole pattern of central. So in those instances, when you put someone on CPAP, it's gonna go away, but it was never truly a, a primary central apnea condition to start with. Now, I know I've just said a lot, I'm not sure how many of you followed what I said, but um, what's important to know is that if you're going to get a report back and says mixed apnea, central and obstruction, you got to really put it in the context of your patient. And patients that have true central sleep apnea, I want to scan their brainstem. I want to see making sure they don't have a central nervous system condition. Now, patients with cardiac disease, heart failure, they're going to have changed Stokes respiration. And that's where there's a crescendo increase in effort, then a crescendo decrease in effort. And again, this relates to CO2 levels. But that's a common pattern. And when you get this decrescendo of respiratory effort, then you get a central pause, then it slowly picks up again and decreases. So you're gonna get this waxing and waning pattern with these central pauses in between. And that's a sign of heart failure. And how do you know for sure that you have that pattern? Because once the patient's going to REM sleep, it goes away. And then once they come out of REM sleep, it comes back. And that's because when you're in REM sleep, you're not breathing based on your CO2 levels, all right? But you do breathe based on your CO2 levels in non-REM sleep. So, um, and, and when I see that, I'm worried that this patient has heart failure. And if they haven't been diagnosed with heart failure, it may be very early on. And so that I'm gonna send them for a cardiac evaluation. So hopefully- On the topic of central sleep apnea, um, Dr. Wickoff heard that those with OSA will eventually develop some level of central sleep apnea. Any truth to this? No. Okay. Now, but but let's pick up. Mm -hmm. If there's some, if the sleep apnea causes heart failure, then yes. So if you're going to say if all patients with sleep apnea are ultimately going to develop heart failure, then yeah. But the thing is, there are patients with severe sleep apnea that I've seen that do not have heart failure. 
and that don't have daytime sleepiness. Um, I, I've seen patients where their oxygen drops down into the 70s and they're like, you know, 80 years old and they feel fine. And every, there's the, the, everyone in the family says they feel fine, you know, and, but the patient has real severe sleep apnea. And I'm surprised why this person doesn't have, why they're even alive. But you have to realize that that's the exception, not the rule. And I'm dealing with statistics. So when someone comes to see me, I'm not going to treat them as though they are the exception. I'm going to decrease their risks by trying to treat these conditions, knowing that they are at a higher risk. But some people will defy the odds. They've got a really good heart or whatever the reasons may be. So it, these principles don't apply in 100% of cases. So um, hopefully that addresses that question. Do CPAPs become less effective over time by making the soft tissue in the oral pharynx loose? No, they, that, no. But what um, does happen, I'm convinced, although it hasn't necessarily been studied, is there are a lot of patients whose airways were, um, and, and their whole brain adaptation to their condition was such that they were trying to protect their airway while they had apnea. And once they're on CPAP, they no longer try to protect their airway. So they get to the point where they can't sleep without their sleep with their, without their CPAP. And once they're off of it, they're gonna be really severe where maybe beforehand they had become somewhat acclimated to their uh, condition. It was bad sleep, they had a lot of symptoms, but at least they were getting sleep. But once they are, the brain gets, they, they lose all that adaptation and they're totally relying on their um, therapy, you take the therapy away, it may seem like it gets worse. But it's not like you put someone at a pressure of 10 and automatically they're going to need a pressure of 12 or 15 down the road. No. Now, if they gain weight, yes. But other than that, I mean, and are they on certain medications that can make it worse, like opiates? Yes. Opiates can also cause central sleep apnea. All right. And so, um, you know, that's another scenario where central apneas may occur. Um, so, uh, but in general, no, ap the patients don't develop a desensitization because it's a mechanical phenomena. You're, 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 it's an air splint and you're, you're treating it along those lines. So, um, Hopefully I answered that question. No, that, that's good. Um, can you share with us or would you share with us how you feel about Inspire or you don't want to really talk about that? Um, what I want to do is tell you to come to my next lecture <laughs> because I have a whole section on Inspire at the next Excellent. talk that I'm supposed to do in about 20 minutes from now. Um, Excellent. Okay, so well, we've got that link. Sure, we'll put the put link up, up again. Put, it up, put the link again in the chat area. We um, really will. Yeah. You know, well, so we'll have to just stay tuned for that and, one. And there's a whole lecture on Inspire um, at the consortium. Uh, there'll be a lot of information on Inspire. So, um, Perfect. but just to let you know, I, I'm an advocate. I have a lot of patients with Inspire. I um, am very involved in titrating the Inspire device because it's not like you have the surgery and you're done. It's more like you have the surgery and you're just beginning. You know, it's a matter of coming up with the right stimulus parameters for treating someone. And then generally for adults, is nasal airway of oral volume the, or oral volume the priority? Which to treat first? <laughs> okay, which to treat first is, is good. Okay, so I'll try to do both in parallel. If someone already has comp a compromised nasal uh, anatomy, I know that, and if I'm thinking about using CPAP, it's gonna be compromised because they can't breathe through their nose, which means then they're gonna to have to go to a full face mask. And now it's full face masks are more complicated than nasal masks because there's more surface area that needs to be maintained with a good seal. And the full face masks, when you tighten them, may push the jaw back, which then enhances the obstruction. So, um, which would be an instance where you might wanna use combination therapy, um, but, um, uh, you know, I oh, at the same time, though, I'm not going to necessarily wait to treat um, someone because their nose is obstructed. And I'm going to say, well, you have to get your nose taken care of first, and then we're going to treat you, put you on CPAP. But, you know, it, the, the pathway for the most restful breathing is nasal respiration. And they say, you know, people refer to oral breathing as rescue breathing. 
So um, you want to uh, uh, um, try to ultimately get your patient to where they're breathing well through their nose, you know, with their mouth closed. And um, uh, but in terms of which do I address first, you know, um, it you know it just it. Uh, um, I'll put someone on CPAP with nasal obstruction because they have they want to, just to see how well we could treat them um, initially. But I'll also simultaneously pursue the, the uh, na uh, a intervention with the with the ENT um, uh, surgeon uh, to be evaluated. And sometimes it's simple, just polyps that need to be removed. But um, we'll also have patients you know, using nasal steroids and doing nasal irrigation, things of that nature. And myofunctional mm -hmm. therapy is also very help helpful. I'm sending more and more patients to myofunctional therapists. They, you know, they're airway coaches. And they have very thorough assessments, and um, and you know there's a, a, a lot of benefit uh, that, uh, and I'll touch on that also in my next talk. Wonderful. Well, uh, we want to give you some time to be able to to take a drink of water, regroup uh, for the next webinar, also. But I do want to talk a little bit about um, the the uh, conference coming up. So I know we have a whole list of superstars here. Um, we just spent the weekend with Dr. Kevin Boyd, so it's amazing what information he'll bring. But tell us a little bit about, you know, um, what, what's in store for the three days. The first day is, is geared towards dentists, and then day two and day three is a combination, correct? Correct, correct, yes. Yeah. So day one is is for uh, the dentist, to, it, and there's a lot of just how do you deal with the dental evaluation, and we have breakout sessions where uh, there's hands-on. We go over the airway exam. Uh, we go over well, how do you deal with an appliance when you first get it to the lab and you have to make your adjustments. What are the things to consider as you're adjusting the appliance? Uh, how do you do the oral scans? Um, and then you know, how, taking a construction bite or you know, working with like a boil and bite as a temporizing appliance. So there's a lot, there's a hands-on uh, portion on the first day along with uh, actual uh, material to get a dentist that doesn't know very much to get them up to speed. But right away, we're getting into high levels of, of discussion and information. Um, so there's, uh, that's the first day. Then the second day is gonna be uh, um, with physicians there as well. You're gonna get an overview of sleep physiology, restless leg syndrome, insomnia, narcolepsy. Um, you know, you're gonna get an overview of other types of sleep conditions. And then talking about oral surgery, um, uh, the role that the ENT can play, uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulators, and, um, and the role of orthodontics in treating sleep apnea um, and, uh, there's um, you know, just uh, going to be a lot of that on the second day. And then the third day, there's going to be uh, discussion on myofunctional therapy, um, more discussion in, in terms of treating narcolepsy, insomnia, and uh, ADHD, things of that condition. And oh, early intervention orthodontics is covered on the first day. Also, Kevin's going to give one lecture. He gives another lecture on the second day about just growth and development and, uh, and just some of why are our airways smaller nowadays. Um, right. And then there's also gonna be a lecture. Um, so Joy Moeller is gonna, Joy Moeller will be there um, along with Samantha Weaver talking about myofunctional therapy and its role in airway management. But then we are gonna have uh, Andrew Maxwell, who's a, a pediatric cardiologist who's recognized this overlap between connective tissue disorders and other uh, conditions such as mast cell disorder, um, POTS disease, uh, and there's an overlap with that and narcolepsy and sleep apnea. And it's really pulled all this together. And I've been seeing patients that fall into these uh, uh, you know, groups of conditions and it's sort of like always puzzled me. And then I heard him talk um, and it's like, wow, I, I, I see these patients and he's really pulled this together, explaining some pathways of why we're, these conditions are occurring. And so he's coming out to, be, to give a presentation and he's gonna talk about something that he's referring to as the spiky leaky syndrome. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's gonna be really interesting. Then in the afternoon on the third day, there's gonna be more discussion, gonna be cone beam discussions. So there's gonna be um, Dale Miles is gonna be talking about uh, just new uh, cutting edge aspects of cone beam uh, and how it can be utilized. And then, um, then you're gonna hear about the apnodent appliance, which is very new that's, um, that 
doesn't work on the regular tug and pull uh, ways of appliances. Um, and then there's going to be a whole session on billing for dentists. Uh, so the, the afternoon is just for dentists on Saturday, on the third day. But learning, you know, um, there's a whole uh, um, uh, uh, section, the last lecture, on how does a dentist get paid for their services um, within a medical system. Um, and One of the questions was tips on building a relationship with the sleep physician. And what's so nice about these live conferences is you're just creating networks and you're you're learning from each other. And, you know, it's one thing I really missed about the live conferences. Right. So we'll definitely have that here. Um, speaking of, I'm just going to go quickly with our updates because I need to, I know we need to get you. Oh, I'm going to sign off. It's been a pleasure. Webinar. I you know, Dr. and one question that you. popped up, one question that popped up about a negative pediatric study and what to do there. Well, you know, again, not all studies have done the same. And depending on the age of the child, if the child's at least five years or older, we would actually do the study with the nasal esophageal pressure catheter. But um, you got to look at how they're scoring their study and, uh, you know, where it was done. But um, anyhow. And we'll put in the chat how to get in touch with you when people need help and they want to collaborate. Um, you're, it's a great service. Thank you for joining us. We'll have you're to welcome. do this again. Three, right. three is Sounds enough. Good. We'll have Take to do it the fourth time. We'll Bye. see you on your webinar. Thank you so much. So for those um, uh, interested in learning more about um, uh, uh, growth and development, we do have our upcoming courses, May 6th and May 13th with Dr. Ben Moralia. May 6th is almost sold out for the pediatrics. So if you're interested, I wouldn't delay in that one. And we do have plenty of room in September. Uh, we do have our upcoming course with Dr. Gelb coming on treating the TMD acute patient, getting them ready for orthodontics. So um, that is virtual, 100% virtual on May 20th. So you can learn more by going to the uh, website on the bottom forward slash Gelb. Love to see you there. And then we have our advanced two-day mini residency where you're going to learn fixed um, uh, orthodontics, bracket and wires, and an expansive technique, as well as fixed expansion in older teens. So this course is also virtual. And we do have our myofunctional course, which is wonderful, uh, especially for hygienists um, who are practicing in the dental office. That's going to be September 9th and 23rd with Brittany Sierra and Carice Laguerre. So you have a lot of time to prepare for that. It's all virtual and it's very interactive. Um, because they do it live uh, virtual through Zoom. So all the exercises are done. If you don't have an, a myofunctional therapist in your area, we would hate for that to be um, a barrier for you. So please contact us and we can get you in touch with um, Brittany Sierra. She does telehealth myofunctional therapy. And some upcoming live events, we're really excited for the Dental Festival in Nashville. We have two full days and we really encourage you to bring your team to this one. It's focused on doctor and team working together. July 8th will be all about airway health solutions. Dr. Boyd, Dr. Moralia, myself, and Brittany and Carice will all be there getting your team on board and excited. And then July 9th is all about Clariliner um, integration. From, from the hygiene chair to closing. So you really have those meaningful conversations to create value from the hygiene chair because clear aligners do a lot more than just straightening teeth as you guys know. So feel free to join us in Nashville. And uh, we did change the date for our Airway Palooza. I know we said it was the weekend before, but we changed it to July 8th through the 10th. It's gonna be at the Westin in Savannah Harbor um, the Golf Resort and Spa. But our keynote speaker is James Nestor. We're, we're so excited about this. So stay tuned for more information. Um, we are going to be opening us first to our um, alumni with Airway Health Solutions, and then we'll open it up to everybody um, after that. So definitely save those dates. We look forward to seeing you. And if you're looking for an airway dentist, go to our locator. You can see um, doctors who were trained by Dr. Moralia and now um, Dr. Boyd as well and find out if there's someone in your area or perhaps you want to refer someone if they're moving away. It's very handy. And if you want to get on our locator, just take one of our courses. We are launching our Airway Health Aligners. So we're really excited about this. It's um, basically Dr. Moralia's um, proprietary case setup software. So there's no distillization. There is no um, lingual root torque. There's no hidden retraction. So you um, won't get that posterior open bite. And uh, you can join this. Um, you can actually uh, reach out to Kevin if you are an Airway Health Solutions alumni. Right now, it's just open to doctors who've taken our course. 
And then we have our Airway Dentist Facebook group also, which uh, we share cases and we have a nice uh, community there. But if, if you didn't take our course, please join our public group. It's Airway Health, um, Airway Health Meetup. We'd love to have you and we can just uh, share and raise, raise awareness. Next week, we have Dr. Susan Maples, really excited for this. We don't really talk a lot about allergies with pediatric airway disorders. So she's gonna hone in on that. And we're also gonna discuss her brand new book, The Brave Parent. And then May 22nd, excuse me, May 4th, May 4th we are having Dr. Ben Moralia to talk about brackets and wires and when and why he uses them in his expansion cases. So I believe that's a wrap. Let's get, uh, Get ready for Dr. Simmons. Hopefully you can join this um, next hour. That will be a CE if you're a member of the AAPMD and um, you can't get enough of Dr. Simmons. So hopefully I'll see you over there and see you in Houston at the end of the month um, for a great conference. Thank you all for your time and attention and your commitment to better health and airway. Uh, until next time, see you next week.